joy to be together today. We are wrapping up our series in the Beatitudes this morning with the eighth of eight Beatitudes, looking again at the words of Jesus from Matthew chapter 5. But before we get there, have you ever read, you know, a portion of the Bible that, you know, you, you get into it and you're just like, yeah, this is, this is good, we're cheering, we're, we're, we're celebrating, and then, then it takes a turn and you look at it and say, well, that was kind of weird. Why did they do that? Why was that the reaction? And reading through the, 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 the book of Acts, you come across several of these scenarios where you're reading along with the story and you're just like, yeah, the, you know, the apostles are doing a good thing. The church is moving the right way. You get to Acts chapter 5 and you find one of these scenarios. The apostles get arrested for preaching the gospel, which is a fairly common thing, especially in the early part of the book of Acts. They get arrested for preaching the gospel, and they're drugged in before the council. All the, the high priests are there, all the leaders, they're there, and they're you know, laying down pretty much the Grand Inquisition at this point, saying, what are you doing? What authority do you have? Why are you doing this? And, 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 and a wiser Pharisee among the council stands up and dismisses the apostles to go to a holding place for a moment. And Gamaliel, his name... Stand up and said, you have to realize that if this is not of God, it's going to fizzle out. We shouldn't be, you know, pulling our hair out over this thing. Because if this is not of God, we've seen several different examples where this hadn't worked. And, and you know, you just, just relax about it. But if it's of God, we better watch what we say. Because we might even find ourselves opposing God. And we pick up the story when they bring back... The apostles, uh, there at the end of verse 39, he, he said, the, the council, so they took his advice, and when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and then let them go. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. Now, if you're like me, I, I read up until that point, uh, you know, where they let them go after beating them. And I'm like, okay, we got it. We got it. They're hurting, but they're going back and they're going to keep trudging along. But they leave and it's almost as though they're skipping and cheering and, and, you know, taking a parade out of the room saying, yippee, we got beaten. If you're like me, I, I don't tend to cheer in moments like that. I don't tend to celebrate moments of physical pain, but... What is going on here? Why would they be so excited to have suffered such? Again, we're in the Beatitudes. We're in Matthew chapter 5. We've been walking through this for a couple months now. And looking slowly at each one of the Beatitudes, we're going to be wrapping up the series today. Uh, an, an awesome series that shows us again the mindset, the heart condition of the kingdom citizen. We're looking at what it means to live as a Christian, the way we ought to think, the way we ought to feel, the way we ought to, to believe. And it's important for us to gather the flow of the Beatitudes. They're not just random bullet points. It would be easy for us to see this as a randomized list of bullet points like, yeah, one, two, three, four, and on down through eight. But this is actually a flow. There, there's a structure here that Jesus is intentional with. He begins by talking about those who are poor in spirit. Those who are, in essence, the first three talk about our emptiness. We're mourning, we're meek, we're poor in spirit. He talks about our spiritual poverty before God, our emptiness before God. And then those who are empty desire what? They desire to be filled. They have a hunger, they have a thirst for righteousness. That righteousness would fill us. And then he begins to expound upon what this righteousness looks like when it starts coming out of our lives. It's filled with mercy and purity and peacemaking. But also coming with righteousness. In a world in broken rebellion such as ours comes persecution. If you have your Bible, open up to Matthew chapter 5. Let's read once again. Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12, as we look at this last beatitude together. Seeing the crowds, he, that is Jesus, went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the word of the Lord. The main point I want you to see this morning is that the persecuted have the joyful promise of the kingdom of heaven. The persecuted have the joyful promise of the kingdom of heaven. So let's begin by asking a very simple question. What does it mean to be persecuted? It's an important question for us to understand what Jesus is talking about, to break it down and say, what does it really mean to be persecuted? Look there again in verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Notice this is not just persecuted. It's not just a wide open, blessed are those who are persecuted. It's blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. So there's parameters put in. This is not talking simply about our aches and pains when we get up in the morning. Oh, my body's persecuting me this morning. That's that's not what we're talking about. This is not talking about suffering for wrongdoing. You know, your, your children, when you have to discipline them, might say, you're persecuting me. Yeah, well, you did the wrong thing. You threw the car at your brother's face. You're going to get a little bit of persecution for that. Okay? So this is not talking about all levels of suffering and trial. It's talking specifically about trials and sufferings that come because of righteousness. Because of our stance and our claim and our hold on righteousness. More specifically, because we have clung to the name of Jesus. Verse 11 opens this up a little bit more for us. Verse 11 It's helpful that this is the one beatitude that gets a little bit of explanation. Verse 11, he says, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. And what he's bringing out here is that there is a persecution that comes when we cling fast and hold fast to Jesus. Open Doors is an international group that uh, pretty much has taken upon themselves since 1993 the uh, documenting and the publicizing of Christian persecution around the world. Uh, there are branches in the United States, in, in uh, the United Kingdom, uh, all over pretty much the Western world. There are different branches of this, and they document around the world in all the different countries what's going on. And they define it as this. Persecution, Christian persecution, is any hostility experienced from the world as a result of one's identification as a Christian. Persecution is hostility. It's animosity. It's it's suffering. It's trial. It's hardship. It's hurt that comes because you identify as a Christian. And we must quickly recognize that we should not be surprised by this. We say, well, you know, Christians are usually generally nice people. They, they do a good job, but why, why would persecution come to nice people? We shouldn't be surprised by this because all over the New Testament, we see both from the, the lips of Jesus and several of the apostles writing that persecution is not the oddity but rather the expectation. Jesus speaking to the apostles in John 15 makes this abundantly clear. In John 15, towards the end of the chapter, beginning in verse 18, he says, If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out from the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. 
they kept my word, they will also keep yours. And then again in verse in chapter 16, just right at the end of the passage here, verse 2, they will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. But I have said these things that when the hour comes, you may remember that I, to that I told them to you. Jesus is saying persecution is the expected lot of the Christian. Suffering is the expected lot of the Christian. You know, Paul writes to Timothy and says nothing different. He says this in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. There's no little footnote there that says all means technically only this bracket. It's an all-inclusive statement. All who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And Peter again echoes this once again in 1 Peter chapter 4, a passage we've looked at a couple different times in a couple different ways over the last several weeks. 1 Peter chapter 4, and I've got the wrong verses in my notes here, sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I have the wrong verses in my notes. Apologize about that. Do not be surprised when the fiery trial, when it comes upon you as to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because... The spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. We see again, the expected lot of Christians across the centuries is suffering. From the earliest days, remember the stories in the book of Acts. Christians suffered. Christians suffered from the earliest of days. They were known to have been martyred, to have been kicked out of the city. One of the biggest examples of that in the book of Acts is what's called the dispersion. Suffering came and all the Christians from Jerusalem fled for safety to other cities in the surrounding regions. If we read through church history, we recognize that early on, the Emperor Nero had a fair affection for Christians. An affection for lighting them on fire. He lit the streets of Rome with the bodies of Christians by hanging them on poles and lighting them on fire. This was in the earliest days. We see the, the following emperors. None of them were great, open-armed, welcoming to Christians. We fast forward to a few hundred years later when the rise of Islam came. And is, Islam, under the expansion, slaughtered thousands and thousands of Christians across North Africa and even up into Europe. We fast forward another few hundred years and we recognize to the Middle Ages when Protestant Christians were being executed by those who did not hold to the authority of the Bible. We even fast forward to the rise of modern missions. And we recognize modern missionaries have died by the thousands taking the gospel to those who have not heard. It is normal for the Christian to face persecution. But with that, we must be quick to say that we cannot presume that we know persecution. We cannot presume that we here in South Florida know and understand persecution like so many across the ages and across the world. I mean, I, I remember when I was in high school, I was part of the varsity soccer team, and we had Wednesday night practices during the off season. It wasn't mandatory, but you know, it's where all the all the guys wanted to get together and go go play and and. One of my good friends came to me and says, hey, come to soccer tonight. It's like, no, i got church. And, and I can remember the, the look on his face. It's like, soccer or church? I said, church. And from that moment, the relationship changed. It changed the relationship. It was never the same after that. Is that persecution? I, I remember with the, with the youth down at New Life when I was leading down there, I can remember the smile on one of their faces after a door slammed on his face. He, he, he turned around and says, yes, that was my first door slammed in my face. 
But is that persecution? There are few Christians in America who have faced significant persecution. In recent years, that number has increased because uh, there are people who've lost their businesses, had to pay heavy fines because of their Christian convictions, uh, being unwilling to participate in certain things. But overall, this is very minimal when we compare it to the world. The reality is, is that Christian persecution is escalating rapidly across our world. It's not declining. It's not a time where acceptance is growing. There are three main drivers behind persecution in our world today. The first is uh, wicked totalitarian regimes, dictator uh, totalitarian leaders who have decided that these are not, uh, not things they're going to allow. The second is the rise of radical Islam jihad that has come back in fierce array across so many countries in our world. And a distant third is what little bit we deal with with the rise of the sexual revolution here in the, here in the West. This is a distant third because you know, none of us woke up asking whether or not it would be safe to come here today. None of us woke up thinking, what am I going to do for a job because I said that I believe in Jesus, I lost it. But we need to recognize that in our world, there is great persecution. This is data, again, from Open Doors. Each month, 322 Christians are killed for their faith across the world. Each month. Each month, 214 churches and or Christian properties are destroyed across the world. Each month, 772 forms of violence are committed against Christians, such as beatings, abductions, rapes, arrests, forced marriages. And these are 2017 statistics, as fresh as you can research them. According to Pew Research, over 75% of the world's population lives in areas with severe religious restriction. Over 75% of the world's population and many Christians live in those scenarios. Open Doors publishes this map every year. It's called the World Watch List. You can research it. You can look it up uh, on your own. I realize it's micro font, but I want you to see the colors. I want you to see the identifying countries where pretty much the darker the color, the heavier the persecution. And they identify the top 50 countries for Christian persecution every single year. And they chart this through a variety of metrics that they use, both the private life, the family life, the societal life, and the governmental structures that are above, uh, that are above people in these, in these places, in these regions, and how, how rough it is, how difficult it is to be a Christian in these locations. If you go into the next slide, guys. This is the top 30. I couldn't, if I made it any smaller, you wouldn't be able to read it. But you see the top 30 countries for Christian persecution. Again, North Korea is number one. And it goes on down through many countries that you would recognize, perhaps some smaller ones that you don't necessarily know where they would be on a map. But here's the synopsis that they gave us from 2017, from the trends as they see it. They said this, in some ways, 2017, the World Watch List has a depressingly familiar feel. For the fourth year in a row, the level of overall persecution has risen. North Korea is still number one. Islamic extremism continues to strangle the expression of the Christian faith. Millions of Christians around the world now, now live their lives against varying levels of discrimination, discovery, violence, and arrest. Key facts to recognize from the 2017 statistics. North Korea is number one again and has been since 2002. Worldwide persecution of Christians has risen for the fourth year in a row, with Asia particularly showing a rapid rise. Pakistan rises to fourth in the list with levels of violence even greater than northern Nigeria. As Hindu nationalists batter the churches, India climbs to its highest ever ranking of 15. 
in Laos, Bangladesh, Vietnam, and tiny Bhutan, things are getting more difficult for Christians. Buddhist nationalism returns Sri Lanka to the top 50. Islamic extremism fuels persecution in 14 of the top 20 countries and 35 of the top 50. Sudan rises to five as President Omar al-Bashir seeks to fulfill his 2000, 2011 boast, now we can impose Sharia here. Turkey rises to 37 as President Aragon uses 2016's failed coup to purge opponents and push his country towards increasing Islamization. Wars in the Middle East continue to catch Christians in the, in the crossfire. War-torn Yemen returns to the top ten, while Syria and Iraq Christians continue to be targeted by Islamic militants. These are the things that this group has just said. These are the trends we need to recognize. This is what you're seeing as they calculate this data. Christian persecution is on the rise. It is expanding. In fact, if you were paying attention last March, you heard from former Secretary of State John Kerry identifying ISIS as being responsible for Christian genocide in the regions where they controlled. In recent years, we saw the optimism of the Arab Spring, but soon that movement was overtaken by radical Islam resulting in mass persecution of Christians across so much of North Africa and the Middle East. And even Russia, just last summer, passed a law saying that Christians cannot talk about the gospel outside of Christian buildings. And in North Korea, number one since 2002 on the world persecution of Christian list, it is estimated estimating, because we don't know exactly, that a solid one in four professing Christians in North Korea are either imprisoned or in forced labor camps. One in four. And yet, in spite of all of this, worldwide, the church is growing. In spite of all of this persecution, in spite of all of this heavy forces against the church, the church is growing. In fact, a contact for Open Doors in China overheard a member of China's Ministry of National Security say this one year ago this month, nothing can stop the growth of the church. At least they recognize it. How is it that the church continues to grow in the face of all this? How is it that Christians, in the face of such dire and adverse persecution, can read the words of Jesus here in Matthew chapter 5 and recognize that they are blessed, deeply happy. You see, that's, that's when this begins to, to be more perplexing. Because Jesus is not speaking of what we experience, by and large, as persecution. He's speaking of those who, for fear of their lives, have to keep their Bible or the page of the Bible that they have hidden in a sock drawer for fear it would be found out. He's speaking to those who, who are hesitant to tell their spouse that they have trusted in Christ for fear they would be turned over to the authorities. He's speaking to the wife who was killed a month ago in a largely Islamic country in Africa by her husband and her neighbor because she had professed Christ. How can Jesus declare that these people in such dire circumstances are blessed? I think the answer is tied together. Why the church is growing and why these people are blessed. Because, 
There is such a joy in the believer in the face of so great a struggle that it is attractive to those around. So how can Jesus call the persecuted blessed? Look with me again at verse 10 of chapter 5. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. How can he call them blessed? Verse 12 again helps to clarify this. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You know when I learned to drive... uh, there in Central Virginia, I, I when I first started to drive, I loved hugging that white line. Because I figured that white line was as far away from danger as I could get. But my dad riding in the passenger seat really didn't like seeing mailboxes that close. And 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 he was like, Mark, what, what are you doing? Get in the middle of the lane. Get in the middle of the lane. And when he went back and forth, it's like, I am, I'm trying. And, and he's like, where are you looking? It's like, I'm looking at the front of the car. That's, that's what I want to put in the middle of the lane, right? It's like, no, no. Look as far down the lane as you can see. Look to the middle of the lane as far down as you can see, and the front of the car will be in the right spot. You know what? It worked. (laughs) I still do that today. For our Christian life, the key to happiness amid the suffering, amid the the trials of this life, is to have that long-range view. That's what Jesus is telling us here. It's it's to to look to eternity. Jesus says in verse 12, Rejoice and be glad now. In the midst of the persecution, in the midst of the suffering, rejoice and be glad now. Why? For or because your reward is great in heaven. Which is not now, when the persecution is, but is to come. He's saying, look to what is to come, and that will give you strength to endure what is now. Notice also that Jesus adds, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is a statement of identification, of camaraderie. In essence, Jesus is saying, you are following the path of the prophets. You're on their team. You're walking the same road that they walked. you remember Hebrews 11? Hebrews 11 is called the, the Hall of Faith. In other words, it, it records for so many largely Old Testament saints who walked faithfully with God and God blessed them for it. But you get to the end of that chapter and you get a summary of the sufferings of so many of those saints. In Hebrews chapter 11, you read so many of those common names, those names that we know and we celebrate. And then you get towards the end and you look at the end of verse 35 down through verse 38. It says this, Some were tortured refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in the skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. Jesus is saying, You're walking with those guys and gals. You're walking with those who believed and trusted and stayed faithful. Jesus is identifying those who are persecuted for righteousness sake with those who are counted faithful over the centuries. You know, God delights when we desire him above all earthly things. And that comes to its greatest pinnacle. When the things of this earth are taken away or we suffer the loss of them because of our delight in Him. God delights when we desire Him above all things. John Calvin said this, Christ does not suspend our happiness on vain imagination, but rest it on the hope of future reward. In other words, God does not anchor your happiness based upon the things which perish from this earth. There are joys that come from this life. There are blessings and joys that we experience through the things of this life. But this life is not our happiness and our hope. It's not the anchor. What our anchor is, is future reward. The hope of eternity with God. That is where we are anchored. That's where we are locked in. 
When we can see the future reward of the glories of the kingdom of heaven, the only thing that matters in this life are the things which lead towards that reward. That is why Jesus can say, blessed are the persecuted. They're happy because they're not looking at the persecution. They're looking at the eternal reward for faithfulness to him. True happiness, true blessedness comes from having a joy that is unshakable, even in the worst of days. And it's unshakable because nothing in this earth, nothing on this earth, nothing in this life can touch it if it's secure in Jesus. A couple of quick applications. First, we need to learn from the persecuted church. We, we think that you know, we're here in America and we, we understand church. We know how to have a church service. We know how to do... No, we need to learn. We need to take notes from the persecuted church. In fact, Open Doors list a series of things that we would do well to learn from the persecuted church. They say this first. Sometimes you need to build yourself a cell. Sometimes you need to build yourself a cell. Remember the words of the psalmist in Psalm 46. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. You know, one Chinese church leader who spent 23 years in prison once said this to Christians who did not face the same persecution. He said this, I was pushed into a cell. But you have to push yourself into one. You have no time to know God. You need to build yourself a cell so you can do for yourself what persecution did for me. Simplify your life and know God. There's some weight to that. It is vital that we spend time with God to grow in Him so we are prepared to stand strong in the face of persecution. The second thing we can learn from the persecuted church is the fact that God keeps secrets. God keeps secrets. We, we see this in Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For the heavens, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. There have been countless stories of persecuted Christians who we have no record. But God knows their story. There have been countless Christians who have died from persecution, who have never seen the fruits of their faithfulness. But God knows it. You see, God knows what we don't know. And we have to be okay with that. A lot of times we get really upset when we don't understand something. I, I, I have that weakness. I want to understand. I want to know. I want to figure it out. I want to see the end from the beginning. But God is saying, I, I keep secrets that you're not going to know. But you can trust me through it. The third thing we can learn from the persecuted church is that weakness, weakness is a direct path to power. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12. This is the Apostle Paul writing, and he says this in verse 10. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. An Egyptian Christian reflected on the way he was treated when he converted to Christ. He said this, in great suffering you discover a different Jesus than you do in normal life. Pain and suffering bring up to the surface all the weak points of your personality. And in my weakest state, I had an incredible realization that Jesus loved me even right then. True empowerment does not come from human means, but through Christ alone. It often takes being at our weakest point to even get a glimpse of of the greatness of His power. 
the fourth thing we learn from the persecuted church is that overcoming is even greater than deliverance. Overcoming is even greater than deliverance. Romans chapter 12, verse 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Persecuted Christians, no matter what country they're from, they often are not asking that the persecution would end. And that's our first temptation is, Lord, take away the persecution. Lord, end it. That's not their prayer request. But rather, they ask us to pray that they stand strong through the persecution. They do not wish to be delivered from the persecution, but rather ask us to pray that they would be able to overcome the trials that they are facing in a way that is honoring to God. It's not deliverance, but it's overcoming. It's glorifying God through the fire that they want through their lives. The fifth thing we learn from the persecuted church is that extreme hurt requires extreme forgiveness. From the lips of Jesus himself in Luke 23, Jesus is hanging on the cross and he looks down in verse 34, and Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. A Christian widow from Iran said this, I only had hatred in my heart for my enemies who had murdered my husband. But one day a miracle happened. God taught me how I could love my enemies. I have been praying for this. Even though on the deepest level I did not want it to happen. Gradually through a process of ups and downs, God answered this prayer. The only way we can get through the extreme hurt is by forgiving people as Christ did. We need to learn from the persecuted church. We need to take notes from their experience. The second application I want us to see today is the call to pray for the persecuted church. We need to pray for the persecuted church. Hebrews chapter 13 lays this out more clearly than anywhere else in the scripture. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 3 says this, Remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them, and those who are mistreated since you also are in the body. You know, many Christians often feel isolated and alone since they're unable to fellowship with other believers. However, the prayers from Christians halfway around the world have brought many great amounts of encouragement and even fellowship as they sit confined to a single cell. Prayer is vital, not not only as a direct line to God, but as a a way to encourage our persecuted brothers and sisters around the world. You know, often we speak of the persecuted church over there, or the church that's being persecuted over in that place. But the reality is, Jesus speaks of it, the, the, the scripture speaks of it as one church. He says here in Hebrews 13, 3, that we are one body. Remember them in prayer as though you're in prison with them. There's a call for us. To pray for the persecuted. To lift them up. The church is being persecuted. And that's part of our body. Let us pray diligently for those facing this great persecution. Make it a part of your daily prayers. There are ways that you can pray for individual groups, individual nations. Uh, Through Open Doors, they actually have a a country profile for each each of the 50 uh, countries on that list. And to pray through that and to pray for the Christians suffering in those ways. The third application point. Prepare yourself for persecution. Here in America, Bible-believing Christians are fast becoming a marginalized minority group. Bible-believing Christians 
are fast becoming a group that has been swept off to the side of culture. The level of persecution we face today is mild. Like I said, nobody woke up this morning thinking, uh, I'm, I'm scared to, to come here today. Uh, I'm not, nobody here in this room lost their job this week because someone found out you're a Christian. As bad as it gets, as people call us ugly names. People might get mad. We might get made fun of uh, uh, as being closed-minded or bigoted or hateful or you know, a variety of other things. But all in all, our persecution is mild. But the trajectory that we are on is not one of greater acceptance. The tra trajectory we are on as Bible-believing Christians is going the opposite direction. And aside from a great move of God and the changing of many hearts, Christians in America will face increased persecution over the coming decades. We need to learn now how to live and believe and trust God from those who are persecuted today. The fourth application, last one, is we need to set our focus on eternity. This is the great hope of the Christian gospel. The great hope of the Christian gospel is that God did for you through Jesus Christ, which you could never do for yourself. Jesus came down, wrapped himself in our flesh, in our skin, and died for sins which he never committed. But you and I have. The perfect one took on the punishment for all of those who have rebelled against God that we might be forgiven. That we might be eternally accepted before God. This is the great hope of the Christian gospel. That you and I would be accepted simply by trusting what Jesus has done. That it's secure forever. And that great hope of the Christian gospel gives us an anchor of hope to look to. It gives us a focal point. Looking down as far as we can see with eyes of faith to the glories of being with God for all eternity. When's the last time you meditated on being in the very presence of God? When's the last time you thought deeply and let the hope that one day all wickedness, all illness, all brokenness, all sin, all sorrow will be forever removed. And let that captivate your thinking. When's the last time you read through the promises of Revelation? Seeing even the promise of for those who are slain because of their faith. Revelation chapter 6 verses 9 through 11. When he opened the fifth seal. I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain. For the word of God. And for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice. O sovereign Lord. Holy and true. How long before you will judge and avenge our blood. On those who dwell on the earth. And they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete who were to be killed as they themselves had been. When's the last time you let your heart think on these precious promises? That those who are the persecuted, those who indeed lose their lives for the sake of the faith, are the ones who are gathered closest down underneath the Father's chair. Cared for. Loved, protected. With the promise that He will make all things right. We must set our gaze on eternity. We must focus our eyes on what Christ has promised in the life to come. 
You know, we far too often get distracted by the trinkets of this life. But I can guarantee you this, in a hundred years, there's not a person in this room that's going to care about any trinket from this life. Much less a thousand years. Or a million years. Set your focus today on the eternal joys of the kingdom of God. You know, the persecuted have the joyful promise of this great kingdom. This is why the apostles in the book of Acts went out rejoicing. Because they had a promise that the beatings of those leaders in that day could never take away. They had a promise that even upon their death would not be erased. We need to learn from the persecuted church. As we pray for them, we need to learn from them. Not forgetting them even though they live in dark corners that are not covered by national news. We need to pre prepare our hearts and minds for the day of persecution. It is coming. It will not be pleasant. But it will be good for the church. Set your gaze today on eternity with God. Anchor your hope, your vision on life with Him forever. By faith, by trusting in Jesus today, that is your secured eternal hope. So that you can say with Jesus, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake for theirs is the kingdom of heaven Father thank you for this day thank you for this precious promise Father thank you that nothing in this world can take away the promise of eternity with you by faith in Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that today you would anchor our hope in you. And Lord, we lift up our persecuted brothers and sisters around the world. That they would stand strong. That they would overcome by faith And that you would be glorified in their faithfulness in the midst of hardship. Father, I pray that today you would move in our hearts to trust you more. Lord, may your spirit move today that we would respond to you according to what you are leading us to. It's in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray.